Well, this morning I gave a presentation of our work in uh, Papua New Guinea. For those of you who weren't there, uh, my family and I are missionaries in Papua New Guinea. We've been there for almost 10 years now. Uh, the Lord's given us a great work to bring the gospel to a new people group, a new area uh, where there are no Christians. And so our goal is to preach the gospel to them and start local churches to do translation work and to bring the message of Christ to them that they would be saved uh, from their sins. And this hour, we're going to turn in scripture to the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 28. And this is sort of the default missionary text. I know that I'm aware of that. And I'm sure a lot of missionaries because of that wouldn't want to preach this text. But as we were leaving Papua New Guinea a few months ago, getting ready to come back here to the States, and we're going to be here a number of months visiting churches, giving presentations, telling about the work in New Guinea, and I have opportunities to preach God's Word, the Holy Spirit really laid it upon my heart to preach this text in churches that we visit. And so this is going to be the text for us this morning. You can follow along as I read from Matthew 28, a well-known text starting in verse 16. Matthew 28, 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations and all the peoples of this world, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And behold, I will be with you to the very end of this age. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless this passage to us this morning. Our God and our Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. He is the one who has all authority. He is your son. He is the one who has died upon the cross and defeated death and defeated sin, defeated Satan, defeated this world. And so, Father, we come to you in his beautiful and his powerful name. We are opening up this text this morning from your word, from the scripture of Matthew chapter 28. And so I ask you, Father, that by the power of your spirit, you would make it clear to us, you would make it plain, you would make it powerful, that we would understand, that we would believe, that we would obey, so that Christ would be glorified among us this day and throughout our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this text is commonly known as the Great Commission, right? Many of us know it under that title. The last statement or the last command that someone gives before their death is extremely significant. Wouldn't you agree? Someone's preparing to die or preparing to leave for a long trip, maybe going to the military for a tour. The last thing they say the last directions they provide or give to their family or their friends or a church is of utmost and vital importance. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing here. Okay, Jesus has died upon the cross. He's been raised from the dead. He's shown himself alive for 40 days now. And now he's going to ascend to heaven. And these are his final words to his people. These are his words to us today. And don't think they're not. We might think, well, Jesus gave these directions, this advice, his opinions 2,000 years ago, but they don't really apply to us today. That's not true. As we go through this text this morning, may you hear Christ speak to you from this text this day. There's an urgency in what he's saying here. Wouldn't you agree? The last thing he's saying... He's going to rise to heaven. He's going to be with his father. His work is finished and complete. He's defeated sin. He's made, made a way of salvation for his people. Now he's going to heaven. He's giving one final piece of information. One last command and directive 
for his people to follow. But isn't it also true that the command has more weight or less weight depending on the authority of the one giving it? For example, a sibling to a sibling. You know, you're talking to your kids perhaps, and it's a, you know, five-year-old, 10-year-old, 15-year-old, and, you know, the older one's boss and the younger one. There, there's not much authority there because of the relationship, the sibling. But take another example, a general to a soldier. There's much more authority from a general giving to a soldier. So it's true that depending on who the person is and depending on their authority, the command will come with more weight. And we're going to see in our text that the one giving this command is the one who has all authority. Amen. And this command is still applicable today. In the presentation, I gave a quote from Matthew, uh, from William Carey, one of my missionary heroes, about holding the ropes. And another thing that William Carey, who's known as the father of modern missions, another thing that he had to fight against and to deal with in his day and age, a few hundred years ago, was that this text is applicable to us today. Many people said it was not. And William Carey stood up in the 1800s and said, wait a second, these words that Jesus said are just as applicable to us today as they were 2,000 years ago. And I agree with William Carey that the words of Christ here in Matthew chapter 20 and all of scripture is relevant and applicable to us today. Amen. There's no other message that is more relevant. You know, there's a lot of talk that goes on in our day and age about many things, many subjects, many messages, many topics. But let me tell you today, if there's one message and one topic that's relevant, it's the word of Christ. Right. So let's get into our text here. We see here in Matthew chapter 28, we're going to be looking specifically at verses 18, 19, and 20. And I'm using the term missions or great commission or world evangelization as all synonymous. You know, we don't see the word mission in the Bible, but we all understand it comes from Jesus' commands to his people to evangelize the world, and we use the term missions. So I hope that doesn't confuse any of you. So looking at verse 18 here, what has been given to Jesus? Look at our text in verse 18. What has been given to Jesus? That's the first question we can ask from our text. And we see very clearly, very directly, all authority has been given to Jesus. Now Jesus himself says this, and it's one of the most remarkable statements in all of scripture, isn't it? What other man has stood up in history and said truthfully, all authority is mine? Now some have said that in some way or another. But Jesus, as the King of Kings, as the one who conquered sin, the one who conquered death, the God-man himself, he stands up and he tells the world, even today, all authority is mine. Not the boss, not the president, not the generals, not the nations, but all authority belongs to one man, Jesus Christ. And Jesus doesn't mince words here, does he? He clearly and directly speaks to us today, 2022, that all authority is his. Is it true that Jesus has all authority? And how do we know that it's true? How do we know that this statement is true? Well, let me give you three simple reasons here. First of all, because scripture says. If scripture says it, that's the end of the discussion. Amen. There's a lot of people who want to debate with what God's word says, but let me tell you, if God says it, that's it. And Christ Jesus has stood up and declared to the world that all authority is his. End of discussion. Another reason is because he's defeated death and sin on the cross. What other man has done that? What other man has conquered the worst enemy in human history besides Jesus Christ? And that's one main reason why he has all authority and because of his resurrection from the dead. And one final reason is because he is now ruling and reigning at, the God, at God the Father's right hand. Jesus is in the place of authority. You know, the president is in the White House. He has his Oval Office. That's the place of authority. 
or the general has his position in the military and he has his place of authority and the boss in the workplace. Jesus also has his place of authority. And even now at this very moment, he is ruling, he is reigning, sovereign over all the universe at the right hand of God the Father. Indeed, he has all authority. There's no question, there's no debate, there's no discussion. Well, next we see in our text, and we can ask the question, who's given him this authority? You know, some fakes have stood up throughout history and said, you know, I'm in charge, I'm the ruler, I have all authority, everyone bow to me. People have done that throughout history. But who has given Jesus this authority? Look at our text here, very clearly. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He doesn't simply say it's mine. He could have said that. But he says it, he explains it even more. All authority has been given to me. Right? If your boss sends you on an errand, or your parent as a kid sends you on an errand, and someone questions you, you're going to say, listen, I'm just the messenger. You know, my boss told me to do this to you, or my parent told me to do this, right? And Jesus has been given all authority. Now, it doesn't say specifically here in this text, but we know that it is the Father who has given him this authority. God the Father has bestowed upon his Son all authority in this universe. Amen. There's a cross-reference in Philippians 2, 9, says God the Father has highly exalted Jesus and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. Amen. The Father has given all authority to Jesus Christ. And we should bow and we should submit in reverent fear to the all authority of Jesus Christ. What does it say here in our text? How much authority has been given to him from the Father? Jesus says all authority. Not just in one realm, not just in one area, not just in one space, but all authority has been given to Jesus Christ. All authority in your workplace, in your marriage, in your church, in your life, in your home, in your money, all authority belongs to Jesus Christ. Amen. Over all nations, over all peoples, over all leaders, over all countries and armies, Jesus Christ has all authority. Amen. And that's not up for discussion. All authority in heaven, all authority on earth, all authority over all the angels, over all the peoples and all companies and all governments and all laws and all militaries and all nations and all presidents. He has authority to rule. He has authority to reign. He has authority to give life. He has authority to take life, and he has authority to command. And so may this text come to you with force. May it come to you with his power, because this is the very word of Jesus Christ. Hence, we must not talk back. I've talked to certain people who want to argue with what Jesus says. We should not talk back to Jesus Christ. When my kids talk back to me, there's a problem. You talk back to your boss, you're going to probably get fired. How dare we talk back to Jesus Christ? How could we disregard what he says? The man who has all authority, who is no ordinary man, who is the God man, how could we disregard what he says, what he commands? How could we question? How could we disobey? Another question we could ask from our text here in Matthew 28 why or on what grounds or what basis did the Father give all authority to Jesus Christ? Why, why did God the Father give all authority to Jesus? Let me give you a few reasons here. First, because his obedience to his Father's will. It says in John chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus says, I have come not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And because Jesus submitted to God the Father's will, and purpose for him. Based upon that, the Father has given him all authority. That's one reason. Another reason is because of his finished work. John 17, verse 4 says, Jesus speaking again, I accomplished the work you gave me to do. That's what Jesus said to the Father as he prayed in John chapter 17. And that's one main reason why the Father has bestowed upon him the name that's above every name and given him all authority in heaven and on earth because of his finished work. Another reason, his resurrection. Romans 1 verse 4 says, The Father declared Jesus to be the Son of God 
by power of his resurrection. Romans 1, 4. Why has the Father given Jesus all authority? Because of his resurrection from the dead. Because he earned it through his resurrection. He conquered sin in his resurrection. He defeated the devil by his resurrection. And based upon that, the Father has given him all authority in heaven and on earth. And one final reason. Hebrews 9, 26. The fulfillment of his mission. In Hebrews 9, 26, it says that Jesus came to put away sin. I quoted this text in the presentation this morning. It's one of my favorite Bible verses. It says, Jesus came to put away sin. That was his mission. That was his task that the Father gave him. And he completed it. You don't have to worry, if you're a Christian, that your sin might come back. It won't. Why? Because Jesus has taken care of it. He's gotten rid of it at the cross. His mission is complete. And based upon the fulfillment of his mission, that Jesus has put away sin, he has canceled sin, the Father has bestowed upon him and given him all authority in the universe. So those are some reasons. In the context of receiving all authority from the Father, what does Jesus command? We've all heard this passage many times. But I hope, as I said, it comes in new light and new power to you this morning from the Word of God. Matthew 28, verse 18. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then it gets to verse 19. So Jesus tells his people to do something. And this is extremely important. Notice all the things he doesn't say. He says one thing. He gives one mission. He gives one mandate. He could have said many things, but he doesn't. He says one. And in the context of receiving all authority, in the context of Jesus being exalted to the right hand of God the Father, and in the context here of Jesus as sovereign over the universe, ruling and reigning, he gives his people one command. And we all know it, verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all the peoples of this world. That's the context of the command. And don't miss that, that's extremely important. And under this, the first question we could ask is, to whom does Jesus give this command? Who are, who are the people with Jesus when he gives this command? Well, it says here in verse 16, his disciples, and most people think that it was more than just, uh, sorry, the 11 disciples. Most people think it was more than just the 11. I'm sure others would have followed him. But the simple point we can make are, is that Jesus' disciples were with him when he gave this command. He gives this command to his people. Are you a Christian? Have you been born again? Do you belong to the people of Christ? This command comes to you. Amen. He gives it to his followers, to those who believe in him, to those who love him, to those who worship him. This command comes to those people. So if you're a believer in Christ, this command clearly and directly comes to you. In some way, some shape, some form, to some degree, it comes to every single Christian. All those born again are to obey this command. Is this a suggestion? Is this Jesus' opinion? You know, just like all the politicians, you know, they all have their opinions. And all the people of the economy, they have their opinions. All the educators, they got their opinions. Is this what Jesus is doing? Listen, I, you know, I have this really cool idea and you know, let me run it past you. This is just my idea, my opinion. Is that what he's doing here? Absolutely not. Someone who says, I have all authority and then gives a command, he's not just giving an opinion. This is not a suggestion from Jesus. This is clearly a command. Many professing Christians live as if Jesus never gave, never gave this command. Maybe that's true in your life. Living as if Jesus never spoke these words. And many other words of his throughout the New Testament, throughout all of Scripture. But don't do this. I want to encourage you this morning and challenge you this morning. Don't live that way. Don't live as if Jesus never spoke this. Where did Jesus' followers have to go to make disciples? What does it say here in our text? Verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of the people only in Rockaway. Oh, wait, sorry. That was the other translation. 
All the nations. We say all the peoples. We are clearly directed and commanded to evangelize the world. That's what we call missions, right? All the peoples of this world. Okay, according to Joshua Project, there's a website, a Christian website, some of you may know it, Joshua Project. There are 17,000 people groups in the world. Okay, a people group, a language group, a specific group of people that we would identify as themselves. 17,000. Okay, and according to Joshua Project, 7,000 remain unevangelized. Okay, not unreached. Okay, that, that's a different discussion. Unevangelized. In other words, there's no Christians there. There's no evangelical presence. There's no one preaching the gospel. 7,000. Now, even if you want to say, well, that seems a bit extreme, okay, cut 2,000 off, you're still at 5,000. Maybe it's more than 7,000. The point is, there are many people groups, places in this world, language groups, that remain unevangelized. And I hope that comes with weight to your ears this morning. There are about 8 billion people in the world, 9 billion. And according to Joshua Project, that website, about 3 billion remain unevangelized. Okay, it's not just a, it's not saying an unbeliever, okay? I mean, there are unbelievers everywhere. It's talking about people groups, areas in this world, language groups that remain unevangelized. Someone has never been there to preach the gospel to them. 3 billion people. That's staggering. That's 40% of this world's population. Now, even if that number is a bit extreme, which maybe it is, maybe it's not, I'm not sure. I'm not the expert in this. But it's got to be close. Jesus says here, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, all the peoples, all the areas of this world. Not just some, but all. Not only the easy, accessible ones. Easily accessible ones, right? There's some missionaries who go out and they're like, well, I'm just going to go target the easy group. You know, let me tell you, all the easy groups have been targeted already. You don't have to worry about starting a new church in New York City. There are churches there. You don't have to start a new church here in Rockaway. Your church is here. Rockaway doesn't need to be evangelized in the sense of being an unevangelized people group. You need to go out into a community and win people to Christ, certainly. But in terms of what missions is in evangelizing the world, we need to target the areas that have never been targeted. That's how you complete the work. Not just the easily accessible ones. Not just the cities. You know, I know many missionaries, I've talked to many missionaries, and many, not all, but many, target only the cities. Jesus didn't say that. He said evangelize the world, all the peoples. Not the places and the peoples that have already, already been evangelized but specifically targeting the ones that have it. Right, if you, if you, for example, at your workplace and your boss gives you a directive and says, okay, I want you to, to go to this, this place and to stop at every single house and you know, give them a brochure or whatever, whatever your company's doing, stop at every single house on the street, deliver this package, whatever it is, and you go back and your boss says, okay, so how'd it go? Did you stop at every house? Did you, did you do it? Well, I just went to the first three. The, the, the ones at the end of the street, they were tough. The street didn't actually get there. It was bad weather. The roads were icy. And you have a million excuses. Like, that, you didn't do your work, right? And it's the same here. That's a simple example. Simple little illustration. Jesus says evangelize the world. Not just the easy places. Not just America. Not just the cities. But all the peoples of this world. Again, we ask the question, which people does Jesus call or command to evangelize the peoples of this world? Which group of people does he give this command to? And as we said earlier, it's his people. Really, there are only two people groups in this world. Those who belong to Christ and those who don't. That's it. You know, there's a lot of talk about the color of our skin and, how, and what languages we speak. All that stuff is really irrelevant. There are two, peeps of peep, uh, two groups of people in this world. Those who belong to Jesus and those who don't. don't those who don't. doesn't matter what color your skin is. doesn't matter what language you speak. doesn't matter what country you're born in. Those things are irrelevant. 
We are all in the same boat. We are all equally sinful. We all equally need a Savior. And this one group Jesus has told, his people, those who belong to him, he says to us, bring the gospel to these people. That's it. If you're part of Jesus' people, then he speaks this command to you. So hear Jesus' word to you this morning. You can't rely on others to evangelize the world. Right? Let's take Amazon, for example. You know, we all know Amazon's exploding. Okay, one thing they're not going to do is evangelize the world. They might provide you with every, everything you need with buy with one click, but one thing they're not going to do is evangelize the world. One thing Amazon won't do is obey this command from Jesus. The companies aren't going to do it. The businesses aren't going to do it. The governments and politicians, they certainly aren't going to do it. The rich and the famous aren't going to do it. The celebrities aren't going to do it. The Hollywood movie stars aren't going to do it. So don't look to others to do it. Jesus gives this command to his people. It might be a small group. It might be a persecuted group. But if you belong to Jesus Christ, this command comes to you. And we should not think that others will do it. So a question you can ask yourself this morning is, will I do this? In an increased way, in a new way, in a different way, will I be involved in this work that Jesus has given to his people in a more direct way? How can you be part of this work or will you go? That's one thing I want to challenge you this morning. Don't look to someone else. What does it mean to go? Jesus says here in verse 19, go. Make disciples of all the peoples of this world. Okay, but he begins with go and do it, right? You're not going to do it sitting in the pew, right? I talked this morning about church. Church, Christians gathered together on the Lord's Day. But you're not going to evangelize the world in these four walls, right? right? That's pretty obvious. Jesus says, go. And so we are to go. What does it mean to go? Well, let me just give some practical things. I like to be practical in my preaching. It means to leave your home and your family. It means that. To leave your home, to leave your family. You can't go unless you do that. It also means you have to travel far. There aren't unevangelized people groups here in Dover and Rockaway. You're going to have to travel far. You're going to have to go to the Amazon. You're going to have to go to the Middle East. You're going to have to go to Papua New Guinea. It means it's going to be in a, ro a remote, isolated place. Okay, you're not going to go to Istanbul and start a church. There's Christian churches there. You're not going to go to Rome. There are Christian churches there. Most likely means, most likely, you're going to have to go to a remote, isolated place. And you saw some of the pictures, okay? We're just one example. Okay, I hope I can challenge and encourage you this morning. There are many others doing that too. Remote, isolated places in the Middle East and in the backwoods of China and in Africa. What about all those people? We have to go to them. There's no roads there. We have to go. And it's going to be remote. It means you have to give up comfort. You know, and I'm convinced that's one of the main reasons why there aren't a lot of missionaries going out from America anymore. Why? Because Americans love comfort. And if you're, if you're addicted to comfort, you're not going to go. It means that you have to leave America. It means you need to get a passport. Some of you don't have passports. If you're going to go, you need a passport. It means you have to buy, buy plane tickets. It means you need to quit your job. It means you need to sell your house or rent it. That's what we do. What excuses do professing Christians give why not to go? I've talked to many Christians, many missionaries. That, that's our context. Our context is missions work. Jesus says here, go and make disciples of the nations. And we've heard many excuses. Maybe some of you have excuses. And I hope I can challenge you to say, you know what? That is an excuse I'm going to disregard. I'm going to get rid of this excuse so that I can obey the command of Christ. One excuse is that it's too difficult. Is that a real excuse or a real reason? Yeah, it is. But it's not a good excuse not to do it. Evangelizing the world is possibly the most difficult task any human could do or group of Christians. It's extremely difficult. How are you going to get to those villages in the deserts of the Middle East? It ain't easy. 
But the fact that it's too difficult is not a reason not to do it. Some people say, I'm too old. Now, you know, I guess if you hit 80, 90, you know, you're, you're getting up there. You know, but you could do missions when you're 50, 60, maybe 70. You're not too old necessarily. And this is a broad statement, and I'm not being specific to individuals, but you're not too old necessarily to, to do the work of the kingdom and to do what Jesus is calling his people to here. Some people say, I can't get the money. That has never stopped God from causing his gospel to advance. Right. It stopped people from doing things, right? We see company, companies fall apart, especially these past two years, left and right all over America. But money or the lack of money has never stopped Jesus from accomplishing his work to build his church in the world. Some people say, well, I have to sell my house and move, and I can't do that. Some people say, I don't want to learn a new language. It's too difficult. I had enough trouble with learning Spanish in high school. Well, like I said this morning, you're going to have to learn a new language. That's what it takes to do what God has called us to here. Some people say, well, my kids are too important. I hear this one all the time. I'm sure you've heard it too. You know, my kids are too important. Or their health and their school and their friends. Now, let me say if our kids take precedence over Christ, there's a problem. It's too dangerous. Is it dangerous? You better believe it. Is it too dangerous to obey? Absolutely not. Some people say, well, it's only for you know, seminary graduates and men in the ministry and pastors and build them. No, Jesus didn't say that. That's another excuse. Some people say, well, I'm not going to be rich and famous. Well, that's true. You're not going to be rich and famous. But that doesn't matter. But if you're pursuing the American dream, which most Americans are, and I hope, I hope you're not, I want to encourage you not to take that road. You know, the Lord puts before us a road to follow him. And Satan will put a road before you to follow him. Which road will you take? I might get sick. You know, we've known a lot of missionaries, and I'm sure you've heard stories too. If they get malaria, malaria is, is big in New Guinea, or you, fill in the blank. There's many sicknesses out there, right? Or I might even die. And I'm sure you've heard stories of missionaries dying. Think of all the missionaries who've, who've gone before us. You know, I mentioned William Carey. Think of Adonai Judson. He was the first American missionary, one of my heroes. Think of David Brainerd, a missionary to the Native Americans right here in New Jersey. Some great missionaries. Are they still alive today? They've all died. You know, we're we're going to die regardless, right? How about we die for a cause that's worth it? There are people giving up their lives for things that don't even matter. Let's as Christians give up our lives for something that does matter. What two actions are we to do as we go make disciples? Look at our text here. Jesus says in Matthew 28, 19, go make disciples. And then he gives two actions that are part of this. Baptize and teach. You see that in our text? Baptize and teach. Those are the two actions that accompany what we call missions. The two specific actions. Okay, now we could talk about baptizing. I'm not going to talk about that this morning for the sake of time. But teaching here. Teach what? What does Jesus say? Verse 20. Teaching them to observe some things. Everything I've commanded. That's pretty radical. Right? I mean, that's, that's pretty amazing. Jesus says, go and, and teach the gospel, preach the gospel of the world. And as they hear the gospel, as they believe, as they become converted and become Christian, teach these people to obey everything that Christ has commanded and said. That's... That's a pretty amazing statement. Not just some Bible stories. Right? You go around the world and you hear, oh, I know about the story of David and Goliath and the story about Noah. And it seems often, more often than not, that a lot of people just hear simple Bible stories. That's not what Jesus is talking about here. Not only the unoffensive passages. Did you get that? 
Not only the unoffensive passages. Well, listen, some of these Bible verses are pretty tough and people aren't going to want to hear it, so let, let's just ignore that part. And we'll just give them the easy fluff. Jesus didn't say that, right? He says, teach them everything that I've commanded. Jesus preached more about hell than anybody else. Nobody wants to talk about that anymore. You know, the, the reality of hell is one main reason we do missions. Think of the multitudes upon multitudes that are falling into hell day after day. If that's not motivation to evangelize the world, what is? And so Jesus says, teach everything that I've commanded. Not only the positive texts, but everything. Primarily, the message of the gospel. The finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. That's the primary message. When Jesus says, go and, and make disciples and teach them everything I've commanded. Primarily, it is the message of the gospel. The work of Christ upon the cross. That through his death, you and I as sinners can be reconciled to holy God. As I mentioned before from Hebrews chapter 9, Jesus has made a way of salvation. That's the message we preach. Unapologetically. Exclusively. You know, we live in a day and age, every, people are pluralistic, right? Every road leads to heaven. No, it doesn't. There's only one road that leads to heaven. And that's the message we preach. Jesus Christ was never ashamed to stand up and say, I am the way. That's right. Jesus said that. And what is the concluding promise of our text? Jesus doesn't end in verse 20 by saying, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. He doesn't end there. Notice what he says right at the end. He gives an encouraging promise. And I hope we can end here on a positive note that encourages you and gives you hope to believe and to obey. Look at our text here in verse 20. Jesus says, and behold, take note, be encouraged. I am with you. Isn't that the greatest promise? Amen. He gives one of the most direct commands, followed up by one of the most blessed promises. Jesus says here, I will be with you. As you go and evangelize the world, as you go to these difficult places, as you send people to these areas, I will be with you, Jesus says. You know, just imagine you went on a, on a mission, you know, for your work, and your boss says, listen, I'm going to get the, the general of the military, or I'm going to get, you know, some rich, famous guy or some strong politician or whoever to go with you and to be with you and to make sure you have no problems. You'd be pretty confident, right? But this may be a piece of cake. How much more that Jesus Christ says, I will be with you. We have nothing to fear. Amen. We have nothing to worry about. Right? It doesn't matter who's against us if Christ is for us. And that's why he concludes this command with this amazing promise. He's saying, go and do the most difficult task. That's pretty much what he's saying. But then he says, I'll be with you. How in the world are we going to do this? Jesus says, I will be with you. How are we going to go to the Middle East? I will be with you. How are we going to raise the money? I will be with you. How am I going to learn a new language? I will be with you. How will people believe the message of the gospel when they're following idols and paganism and every other thing that leads people away from God? How will they ever believe? Jesus says, I will be with you. Amen. So let me conclude here with a concluding application. And I broke it up into specific areas of people. Okay, and I'm going to start with the, with the kids. Okay, I see a few kids here. Okay, unmarried kids. Okay, say 19 and below, something like that. A lot of times you kids might come to church and be like, you know, I, I never got anything out of it. Okay, so I want to give you something specific, you kids. Seriously consider and pray about doing this work in your life. Don't just follow the American dream and say, well, you know, they just say go to college and then go get a six-figure job. That's what America says. But God says do, do something else. Not that that's necessarily wrong. But put your life on a track to do the work of God's kingdom. 
Let me tell you, you'll never regret it. Plan and prepare to this end. Say, so, you know, I'm going to put my money in this area to plan and prepare to that end. I'm going to go to this school to plan and prepare to, the, to this end of doing world evangelization. So that's an application for you kids. Second, for you men, okay, you married men, or you unmarried men who are you know, above 20, consider this important command from Jesus, okay, listen to this, and do it. That's simple. You know, sometimes we, we put so much added fluff to it and we never get around to actually doing it. Okay, so I want to challenge you men. Hear this command and do it. In some way, in some shape, in some form, to varying degrees, you might go, you might send, you might participate in different ways, but do this command. Make it one of your life goals. Wives, those of you uh, women who are married, Pray about doing this work with your husband and encourage and challenge him to this end. You know something that amazes me as we visit churches and I talk to, to churches, to men and to women, you know who mostly comes to us and talks about missions? It's the women. And that's a good thing. It's usually the women say, you know, I'm, I'm interested in missions, I'm ready to go, you know, but my husband, you know, they'll say things like that. And that's encouraging that the women want to do that. And so women, I encourage you and commend you for that. Okay, but your husband might not want to. So that's why the application here. Pray about doing this and encourage and challenge your husbands to do it, to do it with you. Then I have an application here for post 65. Okay? I try to be as, to give the best application as possible. You might want to change the figure, post 60, post 70, something like that. Okay, and the application here is be prayer warriors. You might say, you know what, I, I literally can't go. I'm unhealthy, I'm too old. And there, are, there might be some legitimate good reasons you shouldn't go. Be prayer warriors. Be givers. You know, usually the older people are the more wealthy people, right? Be givers to the work of, of the kingdom. And be prayer warriors. Set apart a day every week and say, you know what, I'm going to pray for the world to be evangelized. I'm going to pray that our church sends somebody out. I'm going to pray for this new couple that's going. Pray specifically. Mark a day of the, of the week that you do this. And encourage younger people to go. You older people say, I, I can't go, whatever the reason, encourage younger people to go. Go up to, to a younger man, a younger woman, a younger couple, and encourage them and challenge them to do this work. Because they'll respect you more because, because you're older. And then a final application for you as a church at large. Pray and fast that the Holy Spirit would send out a couple from your church. And I get this specifically from Acts chapter 13. Pray and fast that the Lord, if it's his will, would raise up a couple from your church to go to an unevangelized people in this world. Jesus has accomplished the greatest work in human history. This is the concluding statement. He has made a way for salvation. He has conquered sin. He has overcome Satan. He has made a way for sinners to be delivered from hell. No other man in history has or could accomplish this mission that Jesus did. And in light of that work which he accomplished on the cross and in his resurrection, and by his authority he received from the Father, he calls and he commands those who believe and follow him to continue his mission by going to make disciples of all the peoples of this world. Will you do it? Let's pray. Father, bless your word to your people. Encourage them, challenge them, convict them that we, as your people in this day and age, would believe and would obey your word. Amen. Thank you, Caleb. That was a wonderful message, wonderful challenge on missions. I hope you were listening very carefully to that challenge today. This time I'm going to say goodbye to our uh, internet friends. Thank you for joining with us. Uh, anytime you want to 
know more about missions, give me your, uh, come back up here for a minute. We're, we're very informal here, so just come up back up here. You need to give them your internet address where they can go online and check out more about your mission. So it's, uh, the website is PapuaNewGuineaMissions.org slash Caleb Melissa. That's our specific page on there. But it's PapuaNewGuineaMissions.org. Okay, and I encourage you. Thank you, Caleb, once again. Uh, I encourage you to go online, learn more about missions, especially the Jabellos there in Papua New Guinea. And we're going to say goodbye to you now. God bless you. Walk with Jesus this week.